freezing point depression and boiling point elevation is a property related to solutions. By preparing a solution which is dissolving a solute in some sort of a solvent, the intermolecular forces holding that solvent together are now interrupted. And because of that, the resulting energies needed to change the phase of that solvent are now different. So looking at different solutes and how they interact with different solvents, you can change the melting point and boiling point of pure solvents by introducing different solutes into the system. Freezing point depression and boiling point elevation are phenomena that occur in solutions or mixtures of different compounds. Overall, molecules are head together in bulk using or by intermolecular forces. These are the things that make the different molecules, even of the same compound, hold together, not through direct bonds, but just through attractions between the individual molecules. Overall, there are, there are four different types of intermolecular forces, and most all of them are due to electrostatics, or positive and negative interactions. The first one, dispersion force, also called London force, is a force that all molecules will have. Electrons surround different atoms and they're in a probability dispersion around the nucleus and, and around the bonds. They are not always in a static position. Electrons are always moving within the molecules. With that, at any given time, there will be one, portion, one part of a molecule that has a little more electrons than the other side, creating uh, a minor little dipole in the molecule itself, one area of positive charge, one area of negative charge. In bulk, if there are trillions of molecules, um, there are multiple different molecules, each with some positive and some negative, and they move around so they can orient themselves to align the positive and negative ends that are continually changing. This is also one of the weaker uh, intermolecular forces. The next one is dipole-dipole interactions, and these are really the almost the same thing. They're looking at a positive and a negative charge, but they are four polar molecules. A polar molecule is something, or is a molecule where there is always a positive area and a negative area, something like water. The two lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen are always a source of, ne of a partial negative charge, those negatively charged electrons. On the opposite side of the oxygen molecule, are where the two hydrogen atoms uh, bond. Oxygen or hydrogen atoms have a proton, and the neutron, or sorry, is, and the electron is in the bond. So those hydrogen atoms have more of a positive charge, and this these dipole-dipole interactions occur with these polar molecules, where there is always a positive area and a negative area, so they can orient themselves and interact with each other and hold each other together. Hydrogen bonding is a, is a specific type of dipole-dipole interaction. Hydrogen bonding occurs with hydrogen atoms and only when they're attached to a very electronegative atom, such as really oxygen and nitrogen in particular. Oxygen and nitrogen pull the one electron from the hydrogen so close to it that that uh, the proton of the hydrogen is almost left by itself and it can very easily interact with 
negative charges on other molecules. So negative charges like the lone pairs of electrons on other oxygen or nitrogen atoms. This particular type of intermolecular force is one of the strongest, uh, strongest intermolecular forces. And you can see this in water, which is nothing but hydrogen bonding, where you can have water bead up on the table and hold itself together almost in a little bubble. This is because the molecules are holding themselves together to maintain that shape. Something like gasoline or hexane, which does not have any sort of hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole interactions, will spread all over the table if you were to spill it. The last type of intermolecular force is the ion dipole force. And this is uh, what can be found a lot of times in solutions. This is the, again, electrostatic interaction with positive and negative charges. You're looking at different charged ions, either positive or negative, and the solvent atom, uh, many times water, will orient itself where the negative area of water will face any positive cations and the positive area of water will face any negative anions. So these are the four different types of forces that hold molecules together and make sure that they maintain their shape. Substances exist in different uh, phases, solid, liquid, or gas. In a solid, there is a lot of intermolecular forces. That's why it is a solid shape. It's a solid object. It is rigid and doesn't just fall apart. Uh, liquids have a little less intermolecular forces. They can move around and kind of meld uh, different shapes, and gases have almost no intermolecular forces. They're very dispersed. They are uh, the individual molecules are typically flying around all over. They take up a lot more space. And where these transitions occur depends on the amount of energy that the molecules have. Under normal conditions, at normal pressures, um, water will freeze at zero degrees Celsius and boil at 100 degrees Celsius. So this means that ice below zero degrees Celsius has to add some energy and break some of those intermolecular forces in order to become a liquid. Liquid water has to break even more of those forces to become uh, a gas. And these temperatures at which uh, phase change occurs depends on the atmospheric pressure. So if something is under a vacuum, there's less, um, there's less resistance for these forces to break apart. It doesn't have any air or anything to move around, any other molecules. So it doesn't have to interact with those. So it's usually at a uh, lower temperature where it boils and somewhat a higher temperature where it freezes. When substances go through phase changes, they're taking in energy, or there's an exchange of energy. When you're breaking the intermolecular forces, such as either going from a solid to a liquid, or from a liquid to a gas, energy needs to be put in into this system. It is an endothermic process. If you're going to form these intermolecular forces, it's an exothermic process gas or gases have a lot of energy associated with them. So to go into a state that has less energy, a liquid state, a lot of that energy then needs to be released. It will be exothermic. Now, when these substances undergo a phase change, uh, there's the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. These are the thermodynamic properties. These are 
this is the energy required for these molecules to undergo a phase transition. Like the previous experiment, there's this enth uh, enthalpy. But in the previous experiment, the enthalpy and energy used was just changing the temperature. This heat of fusion and heat of vaporization is the energy needed to only change the phase. Uh, as something is changing its phase, there is no change in temperature. So at a phase transition temperature, let's say uh, zero degrees water, zero degrees is the normal phase transition temperature between ice and water. At zero degrees, there can either be ice, water, or a combination of both, depending on how much energy was input into the system. Uh, if only so much energy was input into the system, it might not melt uh, all the way. But it would stay at that constant zero degrees temperature until all of the substance has gone through a phase change, and then it can continue on uh, starting to change the temperature. Typically, with a new phase also comes a new uh, heat capacity. An interesting that occurs with phase changes is the Leidenfrost effect. This is where something with low energy needs to uh, gain energy in order to change phases and vice versa. This can be seen in something like liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is very, very cold. So if liquid water is put in liquid nitrogen, it will freeze to solid ice. That freezing process is exothermic, releasing energy around, uh, around the water. Really, it's creating a little buffer of space between the liquid nitrogen and the water as it's releasing that energy because it's exothermic. The same is true when going from something like uh, liquid to a gas. It's absorbing energy from the surroundings to change its phase. So if you have liquid water in something like liquid lead, boiling lead, um, the water will change into water vapor, absorbing a lot of energy from the liquid lead. This was a parlor trick back in the Middle Ages where people would plunge their wet hands into molten lead very quickly and have an unburnt hand. This is because the water was changing into the gas phase and that did not change the temperature, but it absorbed a lot of heat. So they could do this very quickly and usually be okay. In solutions, there are many things that can play a role in, uh, or many things that can change the properties. A solution is something where there is one particular compound dissolved or spread apart in another. Uh, the solvent is something that's doing the dissolving. It's usually in much more bulk material, and the solute is what breaks apart or is just what is dispersed throughout the solvent. Uh, choosing a solvent is very important in a lab setting as different reactions can occur depending on what the surroundings are. Um, when a solute dissolves in a solvent, this ha does have an enthalpy associated, and this is what was seen last time, looking at the heat of solution. But once it's dissolved, there will be a change in the, now the bulk properties of the solution as a whole. One of those bulk property changes would be the temperature at which the solution will freeze or boil. Um, when you add a solute to a solvent, 
you've disrupted some of those intermolecular forces. A lot of those associations and forces holding all of the molecules together are now disrupted. There, is, there are solute molecules in there as well, so they're not as well, uh, the solvent molecules aren't as well packed and are more dispersed. A lot of the intermolecular forces between the solvent molecules would break, but there would be new intermolecular forces, uh, particularly either usually ion dipole forces between the solvent and now the dissolved solute. But overall, the intermolecular forces have now been lowered. Freezing point depression is the phenomena where the freezing point or the freezing temperature of a solvent is lowered by adding uh, in a solute. When looking at um, these freezing point and boiling point uh, changes, it does depend on how much solute is there. Um, and to measure that, a term or different unit is used. And this would be the molality of a solution. Molality is the moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. This is still a measurement of concentration similar to molarity, but is much more specific. While molarity is much more widely used in a lab setting and easily, uh, easily measured, it uses volume. Volume itself is temperature dependent. As, uh, as the intermolecular forces weaken with increased temperature, the space between molecules becomes a little larger. This is why uh, something that's warm takes up usually a little bit more space than something that's cooler. So the dent, because of that change in volume, the molarity of a solution will be slightly dependent on its temperature. Molality takes that into account by using the mass. The mass of the solvent is uh, constant regardless of what the temperature is. But in order to use molality, there are some specifics about the solvent that need to be known. First, you would need to know the actual temperature. And if you're using a liquid solvent, you would need to know the density of that solvent in order to determine its actual mass. In calculating the freezing point depression, the molality of a solution is used because the ratio, the specific ratio to molecules of solvent and solute is needed. Um, each different substance or each solvent would have its own uh, freezing point depression constant. And typically, the, the change in temperature is calculated by the molality of the solution times this constant. So the actual freezing point would be the normal freezing point minus whatever this change in temperature happens to be. Sometimes though, particularly with ionic solutions or salt solutions, there is another factor that comes into play, which is the Van't Hoff factor. And this is because when an ionic solid dissolves, it does not just solubilize itself and spread apart. It breaks apart into individual ions. And each of those ions are now a particle in the solution. The solvent has to surround not only uh, one, but also the other. In pretty much all organic compounds, the Van Hoff factor would just be one. So one um, organic compound 
splits apart from the other organic compound of itself and the solvent surrounds it all. So for every one molecule, there is just one thing that the solvent needs to surround. But in these ionic compounds, when it dissolves, it breaks apart into its individual ions. One molecule or of sodium chloride would break apart into one sodium ion and one chloride ion. Now there are two components that the solvent needs to surround. Same thing with calcium chloride. There would be one calcium and two chloride molecules for a total of three components that the solvent would need to surround. So the Van Hoff factor would change the temp, uh, would cause a change in the temperature change where it would be the molality times this Van Hoff factor times uh, the freezing point constant of the particular solvent. The same can be very true for boiling point elevation. Again, there is a normal boiling point and each solvent has a boiling point constant. So the temperature change or the temperature increase of boiling point would be the molality of the solution times any Van Hoff factor times the boiling point constant. In the experiment itself, in lab, you're going to be looking at the boiling point and the boiling point elevation of a number of different compounds. You're going to be looking at salt water and regular water, as well as other organic solvents and measuring the boiling point of all of them. You're also going to be looking at how the intermolecular forces of these liquids hold the molecules together to form droplets and keep the bulk liquid contained. In the first part of the experiment, you're looking at the boiling point elevation of different salt solutions. You're going to be measuring the boiling point of regular tap water, a prepared salt solution, and saturated salt water. When preparing the salt solution, you're going to weigh out a mass of salt and dissolve that in a volume of water and weigh it again. This way you would know the mass of the sodium chloride and can figure out the moles of sodium chloride, as well as the total mass of the water added. In this way, you can calculate the molality of the solution and the theoretical boiling point of that solution. You can then compare that to your measured boiling point in lab to determine a percent error. For the saturated salt water solution, it's just provided as such, saturated sodium chloride. And you're going to be determining not only the molality of the solution, but also the molarity. You're going to be measuring the boiling point of your saturate of the saturated salt water and the boiling point of regular water. When calculating a boiling point elevation, it's based on the change in temperature. So the change in temperature between regular water and the saturated salt water is the boiling point elevation for the saturated salt water. So from there, you can determine the molality of the saturated salt water solution. You're also going to be measuring the density in the lab. You're going to be measuring out a specific, uh, a specific volume and determining the mass. From those two properties of density and the molality, you can calculate the molarity of the saturated salt water. To prepare the salt solution, you're going to use the analytical balance. 
you can first take your clean, empty, and dry beaker and place it on the balance. You can then tear the balance or zero it to tell the balance that the beaker is one is a mass of zero. In this way, you can weigh by difference through the balance itself. You're going to be adding 5 to 10 grams of sodium chloride. When you have the mass of sodium chloride, you can close the balance and record the mass of sodium chloride out to four decimal places. When you have the mass record it, you can then add 50 milliliters of distilled water, making a salt solution. The salt solution will need to be mixed and stirred before you move on to the next stage of determining its boiling point. With your salt solution prepared, you can then start to obtain the boiling points of the three solutions in Part A. Your, your prepared salt solution, distilled water, and saturated sodium chloride solution. Initially, you Using a thermometer, you can obtain the temperature of the distilled water. The thermometer can be read out to one decimal place. This temperature of distilled water can be used as both the temperature of distilled water as well as the temperature of the saturated sodium chloride. In three small beakers, you will add 50 milliliters of saturated sodium chloride to one, 50 milliliters of distilled water to another, and you already have 50 milliliters of your salt solution. All three of these you can label and place on the hot plate. The hot plate itself can be turned on and keep the temperature at a reasonable heat, at a reasonable temperature. The initial temperature should be somewhere between 100 and 120 degrees as the set point. In this way, it will boil the water, but not become too hot for other solutions that could be nearby. As the water and solution begins to boil, you can use your thermometer to measure the temperature of these three boiling points. And using the mass of sodium chloride that you used, you can determine the molality and theoretical boiling point of your solutions. So once you have the solutions prepared and the boiling points measured, you can determine the molality and theoretical boiling point of your salt water solution and compare that to uh, what was measured and obtain a per, uh, percent error. You can also determine the molality of the saturated salt water by looking at the change in temperature based on your measured boiling point of water. The change in temperature is equal to the saturated salt water value minus the water boiling temperature that you measure. All of these values are based on the measured values in the lab. Pure water should boil at 100 degrees Celsius. However, the thermometers you use are not calibrated, at least not specifically. 
However, the change in temperature, so long as you're using the same thermometer to measure both the saturated salt water and water can negate that, uh, that error. So when you have the change in temperature and the KB and Van Hoff factor, you can calculate the molality of your saturated salt water. And with the molality and the density that was measured in lab, you can calculate the molarity. So as mentioned previously, the molality is temperature independent. It doesn't matter uh, what the temperature is, the molality will always be the same. However, the molarity is based on volume measurements and that can change with temperature because volume changes with temperature. In an example or in the lab, you're going to be measuring the density of that saturated salt water and then using that to determine the molarity. By measuring the density, you're taking the volume into account at these, this particular temperature, whatever it may be. So to determine the molarity, the first thing you would need to do is determine the molality. And that's based on the boiling point, the change in temperature from regular water. Um, with the KB of water and a Van Hoff factor of two, in this uh, situation, if a salt solution boils at 105.56. That means the change in temperature is 5.56. Um, and the molality is calculated to be 5.43 molal. Now that you have the molality, you can determine the total mass. Molality is the moles of solute over one kilogram of solvent. That means for every one kilogram, there are 5.43 moles uh, of, the, of the solute. So you can convert moles into grams using the molecular weight, and that would be the mass of the solute in the 1,000 grams of water. Combining those together, this is now the total mass of, a, of the solution. Since you have the density, you can use the density value to, to convert the mass into a volume. Now you have the total volume of the solution at this particular temperature, whatever it may be. And since you've already determined that in this solution, you're working with a little bit larger numbers, it's 5.43 molal. That means 5.43 moles in one kilogram of solvent. The total volume of that is 1.208 liters. So now you have moles and you have liters and you can calculate the final molarity of the solution. And in this way, you're going to be looking at what is the molarity of saturated salt water. In the second part of the experiment, you're looking at the boiling points of three other solvents. You're going to be looking at hexane, isopropanol, and acetone. Overall, you have five different solutions that you know the boiling point for. Hexane, isopropanol, acetone, these three, as well as regular tap water and salt water. And you're going to be looking at the boiling points of all, four, all, all five of these liquids and ranking them in order of their intermolecular forces. What are the intermolecular forces in each of these five solutions? And how does that compare with their boiling points? 
if something has uh, stronger intermolecular forces, how does that affect the boiling point of that liquid? So in the lab, you're going to be uh, getting a beaker, either 250, 400, uh, 600 milliliter beaker, filling that with tap water about halfway. The water itself does not need to boil because all three of these organic solvents boil at a temperature lower than water. You just need to heat the water up. It should uh, between 110 and 120 degrees Celsius or up to 150, uh, maybe pushing 200. You're really just trying to heat that water up and you're going to fill these test tubes, three test tubes, with about a quarter of the way up, about an inch or so of the different solvents. In each one of these test tubes, you're going to be placing a boiling chip so that way they can boil uh, at, a mo more at a smoother pace. You'll take the three test tubes, place them in the hot water bath, and when they're boiling, you can lower the thermometer into that test tube and measure what is the temperature at that boiling point for each of these three solvents. In the second part of the experiment, you're going to be looking at the boiling point of different organic solvents. You already have the boiling point for water and saturated salt water from the first part of the experiment. And now you'll be looking at three other liquids which have different intermolecular forces. The structures of all of the compounds are found on the label, so you can see what the chemical structure is of these different organic solvents. You'll have three test tubes, and in each test tube, add approximately a quarter to a half uh, of a test tube filled with each different solution. These organic solvents are flammable, so you should not have a large amount of volume in each of these test tubes. You're going to be heating them until they boil, so you don't want a lot of vapor present uh, because of the flammability. The three liquids you're going to be looking at are hexane, acetone, and isopropanol. When you have the liquids in three different test tubes, you will also add one boiling stone to each test tube. A boiling stone allows the liquid to boil much easier and prevents a large bubble from splashing over the test tube. To measure the boiling point of the solvents, you're going to use a hot water bath. You'll start by placing a, a beaker onto the hot plate and allowing it to heat up. All of these solvents boil below the boiling temperature of water, and this is a way to make sure that they don't get too hot. You'll place the test tubes inside the hot water bath and allow them to boil. As mentioned, all of these test tubes or all of these solutions boil below the boiling point of water. As they begin to boil, you'll actively notice when the temperature reaches the boiling point. Then you can place the thermometer inside the boiling liquid and measure what is the temperature of the boiling solvent. In this way, the temperature of the solvent will not rise above the boiling point. All of the additional energy is used to convert the liquid solvent into its vapor maintaining a constant temperature. The second part of part B is still looking at the intermolecular forces 
of these five solutions, acetone, isopropanol, hexane, saturated salt water, and regular water. You're going to take uh, a penny and make sure it's, it's clean, wipe it down with a wet chem wipe, make sure there's no other um, material on there other than the surface of a penny and wait for it to dry. Then using a dropper, you're going to count how many drops of liquid can this penny hold before the liquid itself spills over onto the surface. You'll probably notice that water will hold its shape. You can have a bead of water if it builds up on itself the intermolecular forces of water are holding it together and preventing it from spilling over to the side. In things that have weaker intermolecular forces, the height of this uh, liquid droplet will not be as high. It will not hold on to those molecules as well and they will spread out more easily. So in the experiment, you're going to be looking at these different uh, solutions and counting how many drops of liquid can be contained on the surface of a penny. The next setup in the experiment looks at how intermolecular forces hold liquid components together. You're going to obtain a few different pennies, and using a wet chem wipe, make sure that one of the sides is very clean and dry. After that, you'll take each of your five different solutions and measure how many drops of liquid can be contained on the penny before it starts to spill over. You'll be using regular tap water, saturated salt water, hexane, isopropanol, and acetone. All of these solutions, or all of these components, have different intermolecular forces holding them together at varying strengths. You can then take each liquid and count how many drops are able to be held on the surface of a penny with the surface tension holding the liquid together until, after so long, the solution spills off onto the surface. You'll do that with each of the different liquids and count how much liquid the penny can hold before it spills off onto the side and the surface tension breaks. So, a liquid that can uh, withstand more drops on the penny before it spills over is a liquid that has a higher intermolecular force holding the molecules together and in place. Based on these two rankings, looking at the boiling points of these five solutions, as well as how many drops it takes before uh, the liquid spills over the sides of a penny, you can get a sense for which ones have stronger intermolecular forces and which ones have weaker intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces themselves, as I said, hold the molecules together, and some of them are stronger than others. Weak intermolecular forces allow the molecules to escape in the gas phase more easily. That means if it has weaker intermolecular forces holding it together, it can boil and go into the gas phase more easily than something with uh, a stronger intermolecular force. Strong intermolecular forces hold those molecules together. They prevent them from moving all around and there's a lot of cohesion and uh, those strong intermolecular forces hold the liquid in place. Using the observations in and uh, data from the two parts of part B, the boiling point and the number of drops, you're going to be determining which ones 
of these uh, five different liquids have stronger intermolecular forces holding them together. The last part of the experiment looks at miscible solvents and the intermolecular forces between two different um, molecules. A miscible solvent is something that mixes together with the other one. Some things can't mix together, like oil and water. And in this image right here, this is hexane and water. The hexane is lighter than water and it floats on top of the water. They do not mix. And it's because of a difference in the intermolecular forces. Those intermolecular forces of water are very strong and they're holding the water molecules together, preventing the hexane from going in and breaking them apart. Hexane has very weak intermolecular forces so that would lower the intermolecular forces of water. It's not able to penetrate into the water. Other things are miscible. If you've heard the term like dissolves like, things that are polar tend to be miscible with each other and dissolve in one another. And this would be the case with ethanol or different alcohols and water. Ethanol itself does have uh, some of the same properties as water. It's a polar molecule. There's some hydrogen bonding. Uh, so they can interact with the water molecules and form a homogeneous solution. In the uh, part C of the experiment, you're looking at the combination of isopropanol and water and what that does looking at uh, when you mix these two things together, what are those observations and seeing if you can separate them back once they're uh, fully dissolved. So in uh, the third part of the experiment, you're going to be measuring uh, equal volumes of isopropanol and water separately and then you're going to combine them into a larger graduated cylinder. You're going to look what are the two separate volumes independently and what that sum would be and what is the volume when you mix them together. What is happening to those intermolecular forces uh, between these two different molecules when you mix them together? After you mix them together and know what the volume is, then you're going to add a few scoopfuls of sodium chloride to this uh, graduated cylinder and vigorously mix them together. You can either uh, stir it very well or uh, with a gloved hand or with a uh, parafilm, kind of cap it and shake it around to make sure that it mixes very thoroughly. You're really trying to get the sodium chloride to dissolve in that water alcohol mixture. You're going to let that sit for about one minute or so and then agitate it again before letting it sit for five minutes. You're wanting to let the sodium chloride dissolve and see where does the sodium chloride dissolve and what is going on with the intermolecular forces between the water and the isopropanol and what does the salt actually do when that's added in to the mixture. In this setup in the lab, you're going to be mixing two different liquids together and seeing how the intermolecular forces between the two different molecules play a role in the overall uh, measured properties and quantities of the total solution. You'll obtain either one or two smaller graduated cylinders, either choosing a 50 milliliter graduated cylinder or using a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder and you'll be mixing together a set volume of water and a set volume 
of isopropyl, isopropanol and alcohol. You're going to record the two separate volumes and see what the total volume is separately. In this example here, I have 40 milliliters of tap water and 40 milliliters of isopropanol. Once you mix them together, you're going to see what happens when you combine the two different liquids together and see what happens to the volume. How, does the, how do the intermolecular forces play a role in holding those molecules together and what happens to the volume itself? Once you have the water and isopropanol mixed together and recording uh, and have recorded the total volume of the resulting solution, it should be bel somewhere below the maximum reading of the graduated cylinder. This is because you're then going to add a large quantity of solid sodium chloride. The sodium chloride will preferentially dissolve in the water and not the isopropanol. When the salt dissolves in the water, it will increase the density of the aqueous salt water solution. You will take your graduated cylinder, add a decent amount of solid salt, and then using a gloved hand, you can take it and very rigorously mix the solution together, making sure that all of the salt is incorporated into the solution. After mixing, you'll let this stand for approximately one minute to allow the salt to continue to dissolve and then vigorously mix the solution again and then let this stand for five minutes. Afterwards, you should be able to see the observation of the two different solutions, the water salt solution and the isopropanol. Try to figure out which solution is on top and which solution is on bottom and what is the total volume and does that match the volume that you started with. So in the experiment itself, there's three different parts that you're going to be doing. Uh, in the first part, you're going to prepare a salt solution and then measure the boiling point of water, your prepared salt solution, and saturated salt water. And you're also going to be determining the density of that saturated salt water. In the second part in lab, you're going to look at the boiling points of three other organic solvents, acetone, isopropanol, and hexane, and look at uh, the boiling points between these three organic solvents, as well as water and saturated salt water. You're also going to look how well uh, the molecules are held together through their intermolecular forces based on this boiling point and also how many drops of it takes before uh, the volume spills over the sides. What is the cohesion properties of these different, um, these different liquids? And in the last part of the experiment, you're going to be measuring out a volume of water and a volume of isopropanol, looking at that, and mixing them together and measuring what that final volume is, uh, will be. You'll also add salt to that uh, isopropanol water mixture and mix thoroughly and note any changes that occur throughout, um, throughout that mixture. So look, doing this experiment, looking at these properties, both the visual and measured properties, you should get a good understanding of what the intramolecular forces are, what things are holding these molecules together, and which types of liquids have stronger intramolecular forces and which ones have weaker intramolecular forces.